Welcome back to day three of Conversational Apologetics and Evangelism. Uh, again, very honored, very blessed to be here with you guys. Uh, we left off last time, yesterday, talking about how sometimes uh, anger is better than apathy. I uh, would much rather preach to an uh, angry crowd than an apathetic one. It's not so much the angry people you need to worry about, it's the apathetic ones who uh, have such uh, hard hearts that they are disinterested, have no uh, reaction at all to the gospel. In fact, uh, one time I was preaching at Texas Tech in Lubbock, and I remember there was one particular uh, student who was very outrageous and very angry that we were on his campus preaching, and he claimed to be a Christian, and uh, what he didn't like is that we were telling people that they needed to repent. And that if you're a Christian, you ought to be living holy. And he was very hostile towards us. In fact, I remember he was talking to one of my friends who came with me to campus. And he had his Bible with him. And in the middle of the conversation with my friend, he started ripping pages out of the Bible. Because he was so angry and outraged. Well, he went home that night and was praying and talking to God. And saying, God, I'm just so angry that these Christians are here and they're telling people to repent and to be holy. And uh, he said, uh, here's what he told me, he said, God told me, uh, they're right. And he said, what? He, he was sure that what we were doing was, was wrong. That we shouldn't be telling people to repent and that, you know, to... The Christian life is a life of holiness. He was, he was sure that what he was taught was really a more of a compromised Christianity. He thought that was true Christianity. And then that night in prayer, God said, they're right. So when we came back to campus the very next day, he joined us. And uh, he actually stood with us while we were preaching. And uh, he shared his testimony with the crowd. He said he realized he had never repented of his sins. He grew up in church, he, he always claimed to be a Christian, but he had never truly surrendered his life to God. And uh, we came back the, the very next uh, semester, and not only did he stand with us, he actually preached with us. So sometimes the people that are the most hostile towards the message are the ones God is dealing with the most. So I'd like to talk to you today about the, the right heart for apologetics and evangelism, the, the right motive. So what is the right heart for apologetics and evangelism? Well, of course, our primary motive, first and foremost, ought to be the glory of God. You were commanded to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the honor and glory and, and uh, happiness of God that should be the supreme object of all of our life. And it says in Psalms 29, 2, that we should worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You see, God is glorified by the obedience of His saints. And so by fulfilling the Great Commission and being obedient towards God in that regard, we're bringing glory to Him. And uh, the world, of course, is living in sin, which dishonors God. And if we really love God, we'll want to bring the world into submission and obedience to Him, so that the world will then honor and glorify God. So our primary motive of evangelism and apologetics is for God, to bring Him honor and glory. Now, if our hearts love God, then our hearts will break over the fact that the world is not honoring and glorifying Him. That he's not being worshipped and served and obeyed as he deserves and as he's worthy. I remember back in 2004, I was out on the streets of New Haven at a bus stop uh, preaching. It was the, that same bus stop where I first started uh, preaching 10 years ago. And I recall reflecting on how this city I was preaching to was not in love with God. They weren't serving God. They were living for themselves. And I remember I wanted to take the crowd through the Ten Commandments. And after I got to the very first commandment, 
I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. My heart broke, and I began to weep. And I, I, was, I was a bit embarrassed because I was in front of this crowd. And I, I certainly didn't mean to start weeping. But I couldn't help but to cry thinking about that first commandment. And I wasn't weeping for the lost. I was weeping for God. Realizing that God is not being honored and worshipped and served as He deserves was breaking my heart. And I wept for sympathy for God. Now, I've heard people talk about, you know, we should have such compassion for the lost that we weep for the lost. But I've never heard anyone talk about weeping for God. You know, when we weep for the lost, when we think about their damnation, they are receiving what they deserve, and yet we weep for them. But when we think about God, and how He's being robbed of the glory that He's worthy of, He's not receiving what He deserves. So if we weep for the lost, when they receive what they deserve, how much more should we weep for God for not receiving what He deserves? If we weep for the lost when they receive justice, how much more should we weep for God when He's being treated unjustly? One time I remember complaining to God during a, a season, I just felt like, man, I have a lot of, you know, street preachers deal with a lot of rejection, not only from the world, but from the church. And I remember complaining to God, God, I just, I feel so rejected. You know what God said to me? I know how you feel. I know how you feel. And that's when I realized God is rejected more than I am. God is mistreated more than I am. But God is the most mistreated being in the entire universe. And how sin affects God should deeply grieve the hearts of those who love God. God is the greatest victim of sin. You know, the greatest commandment is to love God supremely. So the greatest sin is not to. God is continually being dishonored by His creation. The Bible even says in Genesis chapter 6, 5 to 6, when God saw the wickedness of man and that it was great on the earth, and that the intent of their heart was only evil continually, God repented of making man and it said it grieved Him in His heart. So sin has brought grief to God. You think of the eternity existence that God had before creation, the, the eternal relationship God had amongst Himself in the Trinity. It was nothing but joy and bliss and happiness that God experienced before creation. There was no occasion for grief, no uh, occasion for sorrow in His eternal relationship uh, with Himself. But after God created the world, God made Himself vulnerable. That here is God created beings that could either bring joy to His heart or sorrow. God made Himself vulnerable. And for the first time in God's existence, He experienced grief when He saw the sin of man. It even says in Ezekiel 6.9, when God was grieving over Israel, He said, I am broken over their whorish hearts. The Israel was unfaithful to God. God compared His relationship to Israel as a marriage and compared their idolatry as adultery. That their devotion to other gods was whoredom, whorishness. And that's why the Bible says God is a jealous God. It's not an unrighteous jealousy. God is jealous for what He uh, truly deserves, what He is worthy of. Just as a, an unfaithful spouse would 
would cause the heart of the other to be jealous, rightfully, because that's affection that's due to them. So also God has been jealous for the affection and devotion of our world. And here he says, I am broken over their whorish hearts. And that's quite something to say for an infinite God, an eternal God. I am broken. If hearing the infinite say, I am broken, does not break your heart, nothing ever could. God said, I am broken. So motivated by sympathy for God and a desire for His glory and His happiness and His honor, uh, we should seek to win the world back to Him. Of course, our secondary purpose in engaging in evangelism should be the well-being of our neighbor. And I've mentioned in the past uh, two classes already that if we are to love our neighbor as ourself, then we should seek the salvation of their soul as if it were our own. And that's what it truly is. It means to love your neighbor as yourself. And you think about, as we mentioned, God being deeply grieved over sin, in fact, the Bible says in Psalm 711, God is angry with the wicked every day. And anger is not the natural state of God. God doesn't want to be angry. Nobody wants to be angry. The Bible says God is provoked to anger. It's not His natural disposition. So our sin has brought grief and even anger to God. And yet, despite all of this, it says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they would turn and live. He still has a desire that all men should repent and come to a knowledge of the truth. If anyone in the whole universe has a reason to be bitter or vindictive, it's God. And yet, He's not. You know, some, some sins are against us. But all sin is against God. Wow. Some sins are crimes against us, but all sin is a crime against God. And despite how mistreated God has been by our universe, by our world, He's not vindictive or bitter. He holds no grudges, <coughs> and He still seeks the well-being of those who have hurt Him the most. So if if anyone has an excuse to be unforgiving or vindictive, it's God. And yet he's not. So certainly then we have no excuse at all. Not to desire the well-being of our neighbor, no matter who they are. And uh, the Bible says we ought to imitate God in his benevolence. When the Bible says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The context was the love and benevolence that God has. Sending the rain on the just and the unjust. You think how many blessings God gives to lost and sinful and wicked men. The breath of their lungs. The food for their stomach. You know, the, the warmth of the sun. How many joys that God brings to the lives of of those that bring him nothing but grief. And uh, we should imitate God in that benevolence. In fact, Jesus said in Revelation 3, 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Have you ever thought about that? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He never said as many as I love, I hug and kiss. He didn't say that. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That's how you know you're under the benevolence of God when He's trying to rebuke you and to correct you and chasten you for your good. It's like I think of a, of a teenager. You know, you have some teenagers, their parents will say, you need to be home by 9 o'clock on the dot. And if you're not home by 9 o'clock, you're going to be in trouble. 
And the teenagers might think, well, oh man, my parents are so strict. Oh, I wish, uh, I wish they weren't like that. I have a friend, his parents let him stay out all hours of the night. I wish my parents were like, were like his parents. But deep down, he knows my parents love me. And my, my parents care about me. And as much as the other teenager thinks, oh, I, my parents are great, they just let me do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want, deep down in his heart, he knows I'm not being loved like I ought to be or protected like I ought to be. And the same applies to God. If God just let us live and do whatever we wanted, we would know He doesn't really have our best interest in mind. But if God chastens us, rebukes us, tries to get us into alignment with His will and with His law, well, now we know God has uh, benevolence and care for us. So Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And that should be our motivation in winning the world, in calling people to repent, and to put their faith in Christ. Our love. Now, love is not a feeling. A lot of people think love is a feeling. You remember back in the 60s, the hippies were saying, make love, not war. And what they meant by that was have sex. <laughs> That's what they meant. Make love, not war. And there was a sexual revolution. And the, and the world thinks that's love. In our own society, they try and classify love, a, a, a homosexual marriage, a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. They think that's love. Our world doesn't even know how to define love, let alone recognize it. So sometimes when you're out witnessing and preaching and warning people about the judgment to come, they might think, well, this is not very loving. They don't know what love is. Love is committing yourself to the well-being of someone else. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a feeling or an emotion. It's a choice of your will. Of course, if love was just an emotion or a feeling, God couldn't command us to love. We don't have direct control over our emotions. There's no switch or uh, switchboard that we have to control. I want to be happy now. I want to be sad now. I want to be angry now. And so if love was an emotion, it couldn't be commanded. But God commands us to love. And therefore, love is a choice. But there's a, a such thing as a tough love. Like I said, Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And if we're not motivated by love, benevolence, it's the same thing for the world, then the Bible says we are sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If love is not our motivation, now it's, you can't always judge the motivation of someone else. You can't always tell why they do what they do. You get into very... Uh, you know, a, 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 a very gray area when you start judging someone else's intention. Because you would maybe look at the Pharisees in Jesus' day, here's people that would fast twice a week. They never missed the prayer service. And yet, Jesus was the one who was able to see their heart. And though they appeared righteous on the outside, inwardly he knew they were wicked, full of iniquity. Because their intention, their motive wasn't right. See, you can't always see someone's motive by, by their outward life. But you can tell your own motive. You can see your own intention. You know why you do what you do. And so we do have uh, the ability to examine ourselves and to look within our heart to see, are we really loving God? Are we really loving our neighbor in the way that we're living and what we're doing? Now, Paul did say that there are some people that preach out of contention, even to bring uh, you know, more trouble for him in his bonds and in, in his captivity. But even Paul's attitude was, nevertheless, he rejoiced that Christ was preached. You know, there is power in the Word. 
And the Bible says the Word will not return void. So I try not to get into the habit of criticizing other street preachers or criticizing other people out witnessing. I don't think that's something that, that we should be doing. I mean, God was, evil, God was even able to bring Nineveh, an entire city, to repentance through Jonah, who had absolutely no love in his heart at all for these people. Have you ever thought about how God was able to bring revival through Jonah? But a, a weeping prophet like Jeremiah never saw a revival. No, if God is able to use someone like Jonah, well, I think He can use uh, just about anybody. But the Bible does say if we preach the gospel willingly, well, then we have a reward. 1 Corinthians 9, 17. God, the Bible says, a free will offering is a, is a sweet-smelling Savior unto the Lord. It smells good to Him. It's what He takes pleasure in, what He delights in. And the same goes with preaching the Gospel, not out of mere obligation, uh, not merely because of the joy and pleasure it might bring to us, but because of the joy and happiness it will bring to God and the good it will bring to our fellow man. Now our hearts should be broken when we contemplate the eternal fate of the lost. You know, the Bible says those who don't believe in Christ, they're condemned already. And the Bible says after their hard and impenitent heart, they're treasuring up for themselves wrath that will be revealed on the day of wrath. The Bible says He's coming back in flaming fire to take vengeance on those who know not God and on those who obey not the gospel. When we think about the eternal fate of the lost, if we have any love in our heart at all, that should grieve us, concern us, as it does God. You know, everyone that you ever meet will have to stand before God on judgment day. Everyone that you've ever met will have to stand before God on Judgment Day. And everybody that you meet throughout your entire life will spend an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. So, of course, that ought to concern us. Now, the greatest soul winners throughout history have been men who have had a great benevolence and love in their hearts and they actually wept for the lost. George Whitfield was a street preacher. They called it field preaching. And he would weep as he preached. And people would say, well, why are you weeping? He says, I weep for you because you will not weep for yourselves. Wow. And you have another John Knox who prayed, Lord, give me Scotland or I'll die. Praying high had such intense prayers, they said that his heart actually moved within him to the center of his chest. Of course, Jesus had such intensity that he, he wept over entire cities. We'll get to that. Now, the Bible says in Malachi 1.1, 1, 1, the burden of the Lord. Sometimes the Bible says the word of the Lord. Sometimes it says the burden of the Lord. Have you ever thought of that? I heard Leonard Raven will say, you know, we talk about, you know, we, let's roll our burdens on the Lord. Let's give our burdens to God. Who does God give His burdens to? Who does God roll His burdens on? A burden is defined as a heavy load to carry. The Bible says the gospel message includes a warning of the coming judgment. Take you to two verses here, Romans chapter 2, verse 16. Jesus says, or Paul said, that Jesus Christ will judge the secrets of men's hearts according to my gospel. Colossians 1.28 says, Him we preach warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So the message of the gospel includes a message of warning, a message of judgment. And that's a heavy burden to bear. 
for our minds and for our emotions, for our soul. There's judgment coming to this world. When I was first becoming very active in evangelism, I remember spending uh, lots of time in prayer and asking God to burden my heart, to give me His heart for the lost. And I didn't always see it right then and there. I didn't always, you know, receive it right there in prayer. Sometimes you're praying and you just feel dry. But I remember one day I was just walking down the hallway of my house and without even praying or thinking about God, I wasn't even thinking about the lost. I felt the Spirit of God come down and crash upon me. Unexpectedly. And it was so heavy that my knees gave out and I fell face first on the floor. And thoughts entered my mind about the cities around me and the people around me who are lost. How many people are dying every day and going to hell for eternity? Every single day. <coughs> and my heart broke and I began to weep uncontrollably. And the, the feeling that I had was that I was experiencing the heart of God. That God was sharing with me His burden. You know, sometimes when I read the news and I, I hear about all these tragedies that happen, it, it brings a lot of grief to my heart that we live in a world that we live in. When I, when I read of all the, the innocents that suffer and the children that are suffering and the, the diseases, the tragedies of our, of our world. And I only know what the news is telling me, what I read about online. Think of all the untold stories that God knows. All the tragedies that God is aware of that we, ne we never know of. So I felt when I was on that floor that God was opening up and sharing with me His heart. And His heart was broken. Now, uh, in imitation to God, our hearts ought to be benevolent even towards those who oppose us and persecute us. That's what Jesus said. Pray for our enemies. To pray for them. To love our enemies. Even to bless our enemies. To do good to our enemies. To overcome evil with good. You know, sometimes I'll be out there on the streets preaching and someone will curse me. Give me the middle finger. Something that to, my only response: God bless you. Bless those who curse you. Not to get bitter, not to get upset. Bless. It's good for you and good for them. Jesus and Stephen, they both had such hearts for their generation. They they had such hearts even for their persecutors. They both prayed for God to forgive the people that were killing them. And that ought to be our hearts. That no matter how much the world hates us, rejects us, persecutes us, mocks Christianity, makes fun of Jesus, that we, we have nothing but love in return. Here it says Jesus even mourned over Jerusalem for rejecting the word of God. How he longs to gather them unto himself as a hen gathers her chicks. But they were not willing. Even in Luke 19.41 it says, When Jesus beheld the city, he began to weep. He wept over it. And the word used for wept, it means to sob and to wail loudly. Not not, not secretly, not privately, not silently. He wept aloud. That's how much his heart was broken over the world. And this morning and weeping, obviously, it came from seeing their rejection of his word. That here he was doing mighty miracles, preaching the gospel. He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the things they had seen, they would have repented long ago. So the suffering of Christ is an example to us to follow. The Bible says in Romans 8, 17, we're actually to suffer with Christ. To suffer with Him. And that doesn't just mean, you know, we're going to be persecuted the way Jesus was persecuted. 
but that when we mourn and, and grieve over the lost world that's around us, we're suffering with Christ. Have you ever thought, what is it that killed Jesus when He was on that cross? You know, when, when you are crucified, or if, if a person is crucified, <laughs> if a, when a, a person that's crucified uh, ends up suffocating to death. Their, the weight of their body suffocates their lungs. And that's why when they were on the cross for a long time, they came to break their legs. Because a person who was being crucified would, would stretch upward to take a breath, and then they'd hang down again. But if you break their legs, they can't, they can't go up for a breath to relieve their lungs. And the weight of their body ends up suffocating them. But when Jesus was on the cross, He didn't die of suffocation. It says that He died earlier than expected, that Pilate didn't even believe that He was dead yet. And it says when they came to break the legs, the other two were alive and had their legs broken, but the bones of Jesus' body were not broken. He had already died. And right before His death, he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. If Jesus died of suffocation, he wouldn't have been able to speak at all. But moments before his death, he spoke and all heard. So if Jesus, medically, he didn't die of the suffocation that crucifixion brings, what did he die of? You know, when, when the soldiers pierced his side and it says blood and water came out, that this is... A, a medical uh, indication that Jesus died of a, of a ruptured heart. Or in other words, Jesus died of a broken heart. And they say that in, in intense agony, and in intense emotional turmoil, the uh, blood vessels in your sweat glands will break, and you'll sweat blood as Jesus did in the garden. It showed that Jesus was enduring not just physical suffering, but emotional and spiritual suffering. So much so that it broke his heart on the cross. So that we're not necessarily saved by just the physical sufferings of Christ on the cross, but the sufferings he endured internally while on the cross. Even Isaiah 53 says that God put him to grief and made his soul an offering for sin. So the sufferings of Christ were the sufferings of his soul, the grief of his heart. No doubt seeing the world reject him, and reject God, and persecute him, and essentially persecute God, even being betrayed by one of his own followers, must have broken his heart. And when we are mourning and grieving over the world around us, we are in this way suffering with Christ. Now the right demeanor of the Christian when we engage in witnessing and evangelism, it's summed up in this passage, 2 Timothy 2, 23-26. It says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. And the servant of the Lord must not strive and be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if God, preadventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who, is taken, who, who are taken captive by him at his will. In fact, Jesus uh, expressed what our demeanor should be when he said, I'm sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. He told us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. What does it mean to send a sheep out amongst wolves? The sheep's not going to survive. <laughs> That's what it means. 
means the world is gonna it's gonna tear us apart. Snarl at us and bite us. But we're gonna be harmless as dogs. The next thing I want to talk to you about is what is not the right heart for apologetics and evangelism. First and foremost, acting upon a mere desire to show off your intellectual knowledge. You ever know someone like that? You're in a debate with someone, it just seems like they're just trying to show off. Maybe intellectually bully you. Use a vocabulary you're not familiar with. That's not to be our motivation. We, we shouldn't just get puffed up with, with knowledge that we want to go and, and, and show it off to the world. Show the world how dumb they are. The Bible says knowledge pops up, but charity edifies. It's the love that edifies them. And besides, no matter who you are, no matter what your credentials are, no matter how much you've studied, there's always going to be somebody somewhere who's going to ask you a question you can't answer. So if you want to go out to show off your intellectual knowledge, just get ready for somebody to humble you. Number two, we should not be acting simply upon a desire to win a debate. The Bible says it's ungodly to have a quarrelsome and contentious spirit. And certainly if our demeanor is not right, if our spirit, if our motive and intention is not right, we might win the debate and still lose the soul. Strong intellectual arguments should be coupled and wrapped in a benevolence and humility. Acting upon a desire to receive praise or accolades from men. You know, sometimes, especially when you're around a Christ Christian atmosphere, it's like, you know, you can receive praises. Oh man, that guy's really on fire for God. He's really going for God. And you can start doing things that show off to get praise from men. Listen, the Bible says we ought to love God supremely, love our neighbor equally. Any selfish motivation is sinful. And Jesus Christ does not reward religious self-centeredness. In fact, he rebuked it in the Pharisees. So then, the next point, how do you develop a right heart for the work of evangelism and apologetics? How do you develop this right heart. First, I think we need to make prayer a regular part of our life. You know, it's intimacy and communion with God that ultimately synchronizes your heart with God. You know, I remember when MP3 players first came out and you would hook them up to your computer and you could, there was a button that said you can synchronize your MP3 player with the music on your computer. And what that meant was, what was on the computer would be transferred to the MP3 player, and they would have the same music on both. Well, when we, in prayer, sort of plug into God, we're synchronizing ourselves with God. It means what's in His heart will then enter into our heart. What's on His mind will then enter into our mind. And we're in sync with the Lord. Of course, prayer will also enlarge your heart for the lost when you're praying for them and contemplating their fate. This will enlarge your heart for them. And prayer for God's glory will increase your desire for it. We should also study the Word of God. You know, all throughout the Bible, our obligation is pressed upon our minds as you're studying the Scriptures. And God's character is presented all throughout the Bible. We're constantly seeing God's goodness and love and benevolence towards everyone. And of course, the Bible speaks of the dreadful and terrible fate of the lost throughout the Scriptures. So given the fact that everyone that we know is going to die and stand before God in judgment, and they'll spend an eternity in heaven or in hell, this thought influences our emotions and our will. That you don't have direct control over your emotions. But what you think about, what you contemplate, will affect your emotions. If you think sad thoughts, you'll have corresponding emotions in light of that. 
you think happy thoughts, you'll have corresponding e emotions in light of that. You can't directly control your emotions. Indirectly, you can. And to develop a, a real grieved, broken heart over the world, it takes thinking the right thoughts. So think about the value of the soul. You know, the soul is the most valuable thing that people possess. Not their cars, not their house, their career, not their money. The soul is the most valuable thing that they possess. And by rejecting Christ and dying in sin, they lose the most valuable thing that they have. So think about the value of the soul. Think of how dark this world is. How good God is and how much He wants to bless us and bless this world, but sin is hindering it. I remember, you know, recently I, I found out I have a younger brother and a younger sister that I didn't know about. Because I grew up, you know, in a broken home. And uh, I have a 18-year-old brother and a 14-year-old sister. And uh, I, I, I've pursued them and I've gotten to know them, but I, I really want to know them even more. And I feel like as an older brother, I've learned so much about life. I've had so many experiences that I could teach them and share with them. But it seems, you know, they're just young teenagers. A lot of times they just don't seem all that interested. Not, not as enthusiastic as I am. And I remember complaining to God about that. And again, God said, I know how you feel. That God so badly wants to have a relationship with this world. He, he has so much He could offer us, so much He could bless us with if we would but, you know, have a relationship with Him, if we would just know Him. And the, the world is really just not that interesting. So consider how dark this world is and how good God could be for it if the hindrances of unbelief, sin are removed. Think of how dreadful hell is. You know, the... The first preacher in the Bible, in fact, possibly the only preacher in the Bible that used the term hell fire was Jesus Christ. Hell fire preaching came from the Lord. And he described hell as a place of weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. A place of misery, pain. In Jesus' parable, he said he gave them over to the tormentors. And in the book of Revelation, John said, the smoke of their torment would rise up forever. No, no dreadfulness is more conceivable than that of hell. You, you cannot have a more horrific thought, a more terrible thought than a soul in hell. And that's definitely spark some sympathy and emotions, compassion in us. Think of the worthiness of God. Contemplate how worthy God is. Never in God's eternal existence has He ever done anything wrong. He's never sinned. He's never been selfish. He's always valued and regarded the rights and well-being of others. God has never done anything wrong. He is worthy to receive honor and glory and praise. He is worthy to receive power. He is worthy because He is so holy. And God has a claim and a demand on our lives. And He's worthy of them. So think of how worthy and how good God has been. And these thoughts will naturally create these corresponding feelings and emotions. Next point I want you to consider is how do you guard against developing a wrong heart? You know, sometimes you see, you know, a street preacher, and like I said, it's hard to judge someone's motive, but it just seems like they don't have the right heart. Well, I think one of the greatest problems I've seen amongst, you know, street evangelists, street preachers, and people that witness and share the faith, is that they can take rejection and mockery personally. If someone mocks them for being a Christian or ridicules their faith, they take it deeply personal. 
And if, if you do that, you can become a very bitter and very sour person. You know, remember that when, when you're witnessing to someone, if you're just sparking up a conversation with them, you know, for the first time, they don't even know you on a personal level. And if they knew you on a personal level, hey, they might like you. I think, I think of that often when if I'm being ridiculed for my faith or mocked by my faith, by the world. I don't take it personally. They don't know me on a personal level. Hey, I'm a pretty nice guy. If they knew me on a personal level, we'd probably be, you know, buddies and friends. It's not me on a personal level that they're rejecting. It's who I stand for. It's the message that I carry. And remember, Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you. So we should have realistic expectations. You know what? It, you know what disappointment is. Disappointment is failed expectations. So I mean, obviously, if you, if you have very low expectations, you, you won't have disappointment. And uh, if you have realistic expectations, then that can also help guard you from disappointment. So when we, when we witness, we should have realistic expectations. Not everyone that you witness to will come to Christ. Your ministry is not going to be any better than, than Jesus' ministry. Jesus taught us to expect the rejection of the world. Not to be surprised or offended when it comes, but to rejoice. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, he said. You need to also make, just make a conscious choice, a, a decision in your heart. Determine within yourself to have the right motive, to have the right intention. You know, ultimately, the state of your heart, the condition of your heart, that's, that's your choice to make. That's your determination. I mean, you see, in the Bible, God commands men to circumcise the foreskin of their heart. God actually uh, commands men to make on the, onto themselves a new heart. James told us to purify our hearts. All of this indicates that the state of our heart, the condition of our heart, it's our choice to make. Are we going to have a hard heart, a soft heart, a loving heart, a selfish heart? That's your choice to make. So determine within yourselves to have the right motive and attitude and intention. I'm doing this for the glory of God. I'm doing this for the well-being of others. I'm not doing this for myself. And of course, our heart should be the same as God's heart. If God wants all people to be saved, then so should we. If God is grieved and brokenhearted over the sin and damnation of our world, then, then our heart should be the same. We don't have any right to have a heart other than the heart that God has. So I think laying this foundation, going into evangelism and apologetics with the right heart, is essential. To be mindful of it. Why are you doing what you're doing? And are you imitating the very heart of God? So let's just pray. Father, I just thank you for this, again, this opportunity to speak. Encourage the body of Christ on some good works, to witness, to share the faith for your honor and your glory, and for the well-being of the world that you love so much. So Father, I just pray that as we share our faith with our friends, with our family, with the community and world around us, that we'll have the right aim and the right intention, the right motive, and everything that we say and everything that we do, it will come out of that love. Father, I just pray that you'll help us to examine our hearts, to see why we are serving you, to see why we do what we do, that it not be for ourselves, for our own personal gain. Father, that it would be as you want it to be, that our hearts will be as your heart is. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we have uh, we have some announcements from.